baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. Let's lift our hands and just love God together. Mm, hallelujah. To Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. And let's... I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Some of the greatest preaching I've ever heard, I have heard and witnessed in this conference. Brother Anthony Mangan, upon our conversation some weeks ago in anticipation of some of the plans for the conference, he said, but he come prepared for whatever. He said, if it, it's right to preach, you'll preach. If it's not right, somebody else will be preaching. It's no... I said, Brother, Brother Anthony, he's like my brother. I said, some time ago the Lord spoke to my heart a message, and I said, I will hold that in the deep freeze until conference. If it's called on, I'll preach it then. If it's not, I'll preach it later. So, for the next few moments here, let me share with you what the Lord spoke to me some time back. Just simply, if you want to refer it, my title, simply say, call it, There Was Given to Me a Thorn. Would you say that with me? There was given to me a thorn. Thank God. Would you just simply say right now, God, anoint your, the lips of your feeble servant. Anoint the ears of your people. Melt our hearts in the presence of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Of all the people that we would not want to <clears throat> compare ourselves, some of the beautiful heroes walk across the pages of God's Word. But yet, sometimes in satanic attacks upon us through misgivings, misunderstandings, frustrations, we must look to some of the struggles and battles of others to give courage and faith to ourselves in our own dilemmas. I feel like every one of us are here for the same reason and purpose. We want to get the work of God done. But we realize that there are some entities, some obstructions, some personal hang-ups, something that is keeping us from the fulfillment of what all of us would like to see in our own lives, in our own efforts, and in our own ministry. 
we're all human. I don't think that we would be here if it were not for that great desire that's within us. But yet we all realize that there's so much more that we feel that we should be and could be doing. And I am so very happy, and I wish I had time to go down the list of the speakers that have talked to me in this, in this meeting. And so many, I thought this morning that uh, last night Brother Kilgore was going to preach my message, and I was almost tempted to tell Brother Anthony Mangan, Brother Tenney has almost already uh, took what I, the gist of what I wanted to say uh, in his eloquence this morning, but um, I did not. I went to the prayer room, and I stayed there until I was ready to come ahead and say what uh, the Lord gave me. But if it would be possible for us to compare ourselves to some of the heroes of the Bible, we would not want to tread on holy ground to liken ourselves, but yet we must learn. And of all the characters that it would not appear possible in our misguided concept of today of the confirmation of a man's ministry, of all people, it wouldn't look like that the Apostle Paul would have had problems or struggles or things to buffet him. Such a great hero and such a great man, but yet he confesses to us that in his own life he did not share with us whether his idea or concept was that the thorn that he was speaking of was given to him by God, given to him by Satan, given to him by individuals, given to him by birth. He does not share. He just simply says, there was given to me a thorn. Sometimes our hang-ups are involved in us trying to figure out where some of our thorns come from. Jesus did a beautiful miracle one time in the life of a young man, and the question greater than the praise and the worship for the miracle that was accomplished, the question at hand was, what caused the condition to have to have a miracle to begin with? We get caught up sometimes on where things come from rather than how to handle it and to get the victory over it. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? They asked Jesus, who sinned? You know, the, main, the, the, the first idea that comes to our mind when something does not go right is somebody has sinned. That was the situation with Job. And I'm not saying that sometimes that sin is not the culprit. But all the time, sin is not the culprit. Job's comforters came to him and said, Something's happened. You've sinned. You're hiding something. Something's taken place in the hidden sanctums of your soul, and this is the reason of the judgments of God. And Job said, You go ahead, mock on, say what you will. And when it's all over, I'll still be here trying to find God. Jesus told those, those inquirers, he said, nobody sinned, neither the young man nor his, nor his parents, nothing that you can lay the blame for his blindness to. He said some things happen just simply that God can get glory out of when it's corrected. There was given to me a thorn. But he said, in my own mind, I will not wrestle with the purpose. I will not wrestle with the, with the uh, origin. I will not wrestle with any of these things. I will just simply equate it to this. There has been a great revelation given to me. There's a great anointing placed upon me. And there's a great, there's a great future ahead of me, a great accomplishment and a great revival, so I'll just write the thorn off as God's way of giving me a balance. Right. 
Now, if we don't come to grips with the idea that every one of us has to have a balance, we are in trouble. Every one of us must have a balance. The thorn to the Apostle Paul was what the second partner on a seesaw is to a kid. The thorn in Paul's experience to him was the same effect as the counterbalance on the boom of a construction piece of equipment. And if you don't think that those things have to have counterbalances, you should have been with us during our building program. One day somebody got that boom stretched out too far and there was not enough counterbalance to counter the thing we was trying to pick up and we turned the whole machine over. If you're going to go far this way, and if you're going to pick up anything over there, you're going to have to have something on the other end of that rig counterbalancing it. Every one of us know the beauty of the revelation of God in our lives and the power of the Holy Ghost. But if we're to ever use that power to its ultimate and achieve the things that God wants us to have, the fact that we're operating out of human flesh, the weakness of that flesh demands that we have a counterbalance to keep us level. Something has got to hold us steady with that revelation and with that anointing and with that respect and with the power of God working in our ministries, if we didn't have something to balance us every once in a while, we'd become egotistical somebodies that you couldn't touch with a ten-foot pole. God has got it all worked out to where you're going to have a battle. You're going to have a thorn. You're going to have an affliction. You're going to have a struggle. You're going to have it because that's the thing that keeps us in tow and in balance to be used of God the way we want to be used of God. Yes, yes, yes. There was given to me a thorn. Now you go ahead and kick against your thorn. You go ahead and kick against it. You go ahead and mess with it and pick at it. Get it festered. Get it infected. And you have other complications beside the thorn. Go ahead! Go ahead! And the first thing you know, all of your energies will be sapped up because of a thorn. Where if you'll have the right attitude about the thorn, you can say, God has got it here for a reason. Let me use it for a balance and go on and get the work of God done. That's right. Exactly right. Yes, sir. Exactly right. Oh, sir. God, there was given to me a thorn. Who shall tell Does anybody feel the presence of the Holy Ghost in this house today? We all dream. We all have visions. We all anticipate. We all... We look at the beautiful things and the possibilities of the future. And sometimes in lower moments, we almost think that we were hallucinating in some of our dreaming. Because the, the devil's always there to buffet. He's always there to doubt or make doubt and discouragement a part of your everyday lifestyle. But I've got news for you. Everything that's ever dreamed has been buffeted. Everything that was ever used of God in the, in the Word of God was buffeted by things that came against Him to stop Him from accomplishing the things that He was sent out and God's purpose was for Him to accomplish. Joseph, Joseph was a prime example of what I share and what I'm trying to get across here today in thought. Joseph, of course, as you know, was a dreamer. He was tagged a dreamer. Joseph was the beloved of his dad, being next to the youngest boy, the youngest for quite a while. 
But then, being the love of his dad, and being the apple, of course, of his, his dad's eye, and then it looked like that perhaps he was going to turn out to be the apple of God's eye. Dreams, visions, the anointing of God placed upon him to dream of things that were, were to be, foretelling the future, the future experience. Nobody knew in the embryo state of that young man's experience with God that it was going to wind up being the salvation of a lineage. Nobody understood that. So, human ideas and, and human, uh, human reasoning took over, and it went rampant. Young men, brothers of the boy, became jealous of the attention of the, of the anointing. They became jealous of, the, of their dad's affection and attention to the young man. It was all more than they could stand. And when in his immaturity he shared some of these dreams, it was more than they could take then. Carnality drove them to horrendous acts of jealousy. The plan to take his life, first of all the plan for the pit, the cloak that was dipped in animal blood, sent back to Dad as human reasoning of what might have happened. Then the compassion of one brother that said, maybe we shouldn't leave him to die in the pit. There's a way here that we can make a little money off of him. Let's sell him to the Egyptian band, sell him as a slave. All of these things were a part of the buffeting, the thorn in the flesh, the thorn in the experience, the thorn in the plan of God. For Joseph's life, the rattling wagon of the Egyptian caravan, and then finally there was a while that he was received into the household of the authorities, but then from there, being betrayed by Potiphar's wife, turned as to where it looked that he was the aggressor, finally the dungeon cell, everything against him. It was, a, it was a, a sad decline into a horrendous valley. The stair steps steadily, one by one, into that deep trauma. But in a dungeon cell, hold on, Joseph. It ain't over, son. Don't lose your faith. Your dream is still as real today as it was when you first dreamed it. The plan of God is just as real now as it was when you ever realized it. Just hang in there. I want to tell you something today. Human reasoning and pits and caravans of enemy and the dungeon cell does not stop the purpose of God. It does not stop the purpose of God. Just hang in there. Hang in there. Hang tough. Don't let nothing stop you. In the midst of the junk dungeon cell, there was an attitude that was kept right. There was a heart that was kept clean. There was a mind that was kept sensitive to the voice of God. In that dungeon, he was able to tell the interpretation of a dream that put a fellow prisoner back into his position. And upon departing, he said, when all is well with thee, remember me. Remember me. I'm going through a little time right now where the thorn is a little hard to cope with, but it's not over. I'll be out someday just remember me and pray for me when everything is well with you. Hallelujah. The most beautiful thing to me about the story as far as Joseph's attitude and coping was concerned, the purpose of God, of course, was the salvation of the lineage, God's lineage. But the most beautiful thing about the whole story to me concerning Joseph was that in playing the role that he played to fulfill God's purpose, he understood, and it was evident, that it was the things that he learned in the valley that let him know how to act when he got back to the throne. If it had not been for those dungeon 
pit, slavery experiences. If it hadn't been for the hurting in midnight hours, if it hadn't been for the loneliness year in and year out, if it hadn't been for the concern and the love and the empathy that was born in his heart, when his brothers finally came to kneel before his feet like he had already dreamed, he would have reached for a sword instead of a grain sack. But he was conditioned to know what to reach for when the dream was fulfilled. Instead of reaching for a sword of vengeance, he reached for the grain sack that would help God spare the lineage. Sometimes, saints of God, ministers of the gospel, we don't understand what's a happening when all of these things are buffeting us. We don't understand what's a taking place on the outside and on the inside when some of these things... Now look, nobody loves to preach revival and shouting and miracles any more than I do. But every once in a while, we have got... And I'm not knocking anything that we've heard. Everything has been totally level in this whole meeting. But what I'm saying, every once in a while, we've got to be realistic with ourselves. We've got to understand that there's some things that we don't understand, and we've got to go ahead and have an answer for our own human reasoning in these efforts. Because it's in times when the devil's are buffeting you, when you're doing a godly thing, that he will come back around then and say, if you was doing right, if you was on God's side and he's on your side, it wouldn't be happening like this, would it? Huh? Come on, be reasonable. It wouldn't be happening like this if God was on your side. There was something exposed to me here three or four years ago when Joan and I were invited to go to Columbia to preach the conference there. I'll never forget it as long as I live. Two times we went there. And in a little old, little old hotel that was, you would have hardly wanted to have rented here, but it was the finest they had. Just a little old cubby hole with two little cots where Joan and I slept and a piece of iron or wood or something that you could hang your clothes on in the corner. It was the finest they had. But I, I came in one day and I, it, something happened to me. Something dawned on me. I looked at Joan and I said, Joan, if our American concept of God's favor on our lives. If our American concept of the favor of God on our lives is right, that means Columbia don't even have a God. Because in our concept, we gauge the favor of God on our lives by material blessings. You know it as well as I know. If something happens to one of the saints in your church, or the first thing he'll hear on the job, you must not pay the preacher. See, it's a material concept. A material concept. We, 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 and, and I know, we, we bring people into a state of conversion and God begins to bless them because, and that's beautiful and good. But we cannot come to bear with this idea that material blessings is synonymous with the favor of God. We cannot afford to do that. Because I witnessed it with my own eye. While American side, you have to beg people to stand on their feet and raise their hands and lift their hands to God. And we have everything under the sun materially to thank Him for. When we go to general conference, you have to have taxi cabs to carry the people. Another taxi cab to carry the luggage. When they come to their general conference, their bedroll, everything they had, dress, 
wardrobe and all was in a little paper sack. But yet, when they were standing to praise God, you'd have to get microphones and PA systems and horns to try to get them set down so you could go on with the service. When all they had to thank God for was the fact that He had saved them from a devil's hell. That's all. I say again, if materialism is the synonymous with the favor of God on our lives, Columbia has no God. Haiti has no God. But that's not the case. That's not the case. You can have the same love and the same relationship and the same favor with the God of glory if you don't have a plug nickel in your pocket, Brother D's. If you don't have a plug nickel or a copper penny in your pocket, you can have the love and the joy and the relationship and the favor and the anointing of God on your life. But things happen to give us balance. Every church you ever pass, and there's a beautiful building, and a thriving, successful congregation, you look real close. Somewhere on that lawn, you will see a tombstone. Somebody died for that church to live. There's a balance. Who shall fall by? Somebody died for it to happen. Somebody died for it to happen. It don't just spring up without cause. Somebody paid the price on the side of the counterbalance for the boom to reach out as far as it did. I'm telling you, preacher, you hear me? If you want to be used of God, somewhere there's going to be a counterbalance called a thorn to give you the power to reach further in your ministry. I'm not asking for any more. I'm not asking for any more. But I'm telling you, for just a small degree at least, I speak from experience. And I do not try to claim anything for myself. But my dear dad, before the sickness happened to him, my dear dad told his church, I'm praying a prayer. I want God to give my church revival. And it don't matter what it cost me. If it cost my life, I want my church to have revival. His church had the revival, Brother Anthony. It did. Kenneth Phillips was the one that came in 66 and preached it for us. The boy that has his hand lifted right yonder is the one of the first ones that got the Holy Ghost in that revival. He's a young preacher trying to get us started into the ministry right now. A great anointing of God on his life. Dad's church had that revival, but you know what it cost? He was smitten with a stroke. Never got into a pulpit to preach the way he had once preached before. Not ever again. Not ever again. But one month after that, Kenneth and Wanda were on their way to conference. They came through, pulled their trailer through Lake Charles on the way to park it here to go to conference. They stopped at a truck stop and said, called us. They said, come over and have lunch with us. I said, where are you going? He said, we're going to park the trailer to go to conference. They said, no, you ain't. You're fixing to park the trailer right by mine. 
After Dad had that stroke, I went straight home. I sat there. I started continuing to build that church that he had already started. For one month, we didn't know whether the church was going to fold or what it was going to do because they didn't understand. They were without a shepherd. He was the building contractor. He had it all. He knew what was going on. And the only thing that I knew as a little old 25-year-old evangelist was to walk in there and go to preach it. We're going to have revival. Revival at midnight. Revival at midnight. Revival at midnight. Preaching that kind of sermons for a month, Kenneth came along and said, you're going to put your trailer by mine. We're going to have a revival. We started on Wednesday night. That little old church that was, that was drowning in self-pity. Drowning because of the thorn. Drowning in unbelief. Despair. The gloom had so gotten a hold of them. We're going to have revival, though. We're going to have revival. We're going to have revival. Kenneth got up. Pardon me, Brother Phillips. Don't, don't, don't hold me. Let me call him Kenneth. They didn't understand. They were without a shepherd. He was the building contractor. He had it all. He knew what was going on. And the only thing that I knew as a little old 25-year-old evangelist was to walk in there and go to preach it. We're going to have revival. Revival at midnight. Revival at midnight. Revival at midnight. Preaching that kind of sermons for a month, Kenneth came along and said, You're going to put your trailer by mine. We're going to have a revival. We started on Wednesday night. That little old church that was that was drowning in self pity, drowning because of the thorn, drowning in unbelief, despair. The gloom had so gotten a hold of them. We're gonna have revival, though. We're gonna have revival. We're gonna have revival. Kenneth got up. Pardon me, Brother Phillips. Don't 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 hold me. Let me call him Kenneth. He's my friend. From way on back. But he came and parked his trailer just like I told him he was. On Wednesday night he told the people, he said, Some of you'd call me a false prophet if I told you that twelve or fifteen people would have the Holy Ghost by that Sunday night. Those poor little people if they had false teeth that like to fell out in their lap. My God, what are you talking about? Man, our pastor laying at the point of death. Here you are. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? But you know what happened? There's about two or three got the Holy Ghost during that week. On that Sunday night. You know what happened? We was giving an offering. That night I felt like having everybody come up and, and march around the offering pan. There was a little old lady sitting over there. She was not a Pentecostal. She came down. She gave her offering. One dollar. She started back toward the seat. And when she started back toward the seat, she got right over here. And the Holy Ghost hit her. She threw up her hands and went to talking in tongues. When that happened, that man right back there, stand up, Brother Larry. That man, his, his wife, who was just his girlfriend at that point, she led him down the aisle. Or his sister, one of them, led him down the aisle. And when he got down the aisle, the ministry laid hands on him. When the ministry laid hands on him, the Holy Ghost hit him, knocked him to the ground. When, he, when his head hit the floor, he went to talking in tongues. But when he got up, he could see, hallelujah, hallelujah. God had restored his sight while he was on the floor receiving the Holy Ghost. That built faith. We said, everybody else that wants the Holy Ghost, come on across the platform. We marched them across the platform, and everything in the house that didn't have the Holy Ghost that night prayed through and talked in tongues when the ministry laid hands on them. I'm talking about revival at midnight. But you hear me? There was a thorn, a thorn, a thorn. I wish every one of you could drive along Interstate 10 now and see 15, 16 years from that time 
another church, nine and a half acres on I-10, 1,200 foot of frontage, a beautiful church there that I don't take glory for. There were thorns that gave birth to that church. Thorns, 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 Brother Mike Williams. What you're encountering right now, you hear me, it's a thorn. But it's going to give you a counterbalance that will reach further than you ever dreamed of reaching in your ministry. Somebody believe what I'm preaching right now. Somebody believe what I'm preaching right now. We saw the property. I I drove the streets of Lake Charles praying, God, I never will forget. I drove the interstate. About every area of our city is covered with another one of our Pentecostal churches. I wouldn't have infringed on another one of their territories for anything in the world. I drove the freeway, the outer perimeter. I said, God, I hate to spend this much money back here in the corner where your church and your truth, your full gospel cannot even be seen. Please open up something. If it's not your will to open it up, I'm not asking for a kingdom. I'm not asking for the advancement of Eastwood or the advancement of the Ewing name. Please, God, for your cause. I get tired of churches with less than the truth having all the exposure. I want one of God's churches that preaches this Acts 238 message. I want them to have forefront. It was a nine and a half acre track, three blocks down the street from where our old church was. But it happened to be in the corner of the main east and west thoroughfare, I-10, and the north-south thoroughfare. 171, the main crossroads of southwest Louisiana. But that nine and a half acres was not for sale. It had been in the same family for 70 years. And then the grandfather of the man whose heirs we brought it from owned it before that. I don't know how long he owned it. They just wouldn't sell it. It wasn't for sale. But when God's preacher got desperate for a cause, Two of the heirs of one of the original heirs just all of a sudden wanted their money. They had to sell the property to satisfy those two heirs. I drove just a few nights after I prayed that prayer, and there was a for sale sign on that piece of property. I called about it. They said, yeah, it's for sale. The people lived in Alexandria. We want 300000 for it. I figured they'd have been asking 100000 an acre. You hear me? God knows how to open the doors at the right time. But between the time when we found the property and when we made the deal on it, the more thorn. First of all, I lost my voice. Six months, I didn't know whether I'd ever sing again. One night, I was trying to recoup. I couldn't go into the higher tones, and you know singing's a part of my life. Ministry's my first love, but singing is a part of my ministry. And I was in my, I was in my bedroom, and I'd gone for about two or three months, and I was saying, God, I know I don't want to damage my voice anymore, but I've got to know if I've got anything left, if I'll ever get to sing again. So I started on the scale. Do re mi fa sol la ti. With just a blockage that the higher I try to go, it just nose off. I couldn't, I couldn't force it to come through. My little old bunny was in the other room, and she didn't know what was going on. She just, she burst through our bedroom door. Mama, mama, somebody's cows out in the yard. (laughs) 
Joan looked back at her, and with tears in her eyes, she told Monty, she said, No, darling, that's not a cow. That was Daddy trying to sing. And when Bonnie understood what it was, she had to laugh because it was so funny, but tears were streaming down her eyes at the same time. That was the first thing. When I finally learned how to sing again, I had to learn how to sing again. But when I learned how, then the next thing was a blood clot in my leg. I was on my way to Delaware to take care of take an engagement and a blood clot in my leg. The next thing, when I finally got over the blood clot in my leg, I came to preach the youth camp here in our own district and thank God for the, for the invitation that was extended to me. But it was during that youth camp that I was in such pain that I would roll in the floor during the night after I'd preach. When I went home, found out that there was a mass in my colon. When they went in, it was malignant. They took the thing out. While I was recuperating from that, my dad in the hospital for gallbladder surgery, we thought. Before he got out of there, his heart failed. I lost him in the hospital. Things kept going until finally, when Joan and I would go over the overpass and we'd see that, that piece of property. You, you didn't even want to look at it. Please hear what I'm saying. There'll be times. I never heard anybody any more honest than Jim Larson was the other night when he said in the battle of that church building program, even suicidal thoughts come through his mind. I'm telling you, if you don't have something to anchor yourself to, if you don't have a counterbalance and know something about why that balance is there, it'll drive you up a wall when you get in the dark times. You hear me? And there's so much more that I want to preach, but I don't have time and I don't want to fringe on anybody's time. But you hear me? The greatest lesson of what balance is all about. We know the glories of Pentecost. We know the powers of an upper room. But we paid very little visits to a hill called Calvary. But you remember, there was a counterbalance called Calvary that purchased the right of a glorious Pentecost. But you know what happened at Calvary? There were people at Calvary that were there because love drove them there. But there were others there because wanting to be a spectator drove them there. Through different eyes, two crowds saw two different things. One was driven away by the spectator crowd. And the Bible says they had to view it from a distance. While spectators walked out. Scripture says when they saw the sight and what was done there, it moved them. They, they, they couldn't look at it and just walk away. They had to give some kind of expression so they just want their breaths and they turned home. But you hear me? Calvary purchased more than just for a spectator to smite his breast. Calvary purchased the right the devotion. Humbling oneself at the foot of that sacred brow and identifying with the price that was paid there. Your spiritual level will determine what you see. If you're carnal, you'll see fear. If you're carnal, you'll see, you'll see hypocrites. If you're carnal, you'll always see devils. And that don't mean that it don't exist. 
But if you ever get on a higher plane and go to looking through different eyes instead of fear, you're going to see in faith. Instead of hypocrites, you're going to see in saints. And instead of devils, you'll see 15 angels between you and every devil. Would you stand? Lift your hand to God. They didn't understand. They were without a shepherd. He was the building contractor. He had it all. He knew what was going on. And the only thing that I knew as a little old 25 year old evangelist was to walk in there and go to preach it. We're going to have revival. Revival at midnight. Revival at midnight. Revival at midnight. Preaching that kind of sermons for a month, Kenneth came along and said, You're going to put your trail of a mind. We're going to have a revival. We started on Wednesday night. That little old church that was that was drowning in self pity, drowning because of the thorn, drowning in unbelief, despair. The gloom had so gotten a hold of them. We're gonna have revival, though. We're gonna have revival. We're gonna have revival. Kenneth got up. Pardon me, Brother Phillips. Don't 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 hold me. Let me call him Kenneth. He's my friend from way on back. But he came and parked his trailer just like I told him he was. On Wednesday night he told the people, he said, some of you would call me a false prophet if I told you that 12 or 15 people would have the Holy Ghost by Sunday night. Those poor little people, if they had false teeth, they'd like to fell out in their lap. My God, what are you talking about? Man, our pastor laying at the point of death. Here you are. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? But you know what happened? There's about two or three got the Holy Ghost during that week. On that Sunday night. You know what happened? We was giving an offering. That night I felt like having everybody come up and, and march around the offering pan. There was a little old lady sitting over there. She was not a Pentecostal. She came down. She gave her offering. One dollar. She started back toward the seat. And when she started back toward the seat, she got right over here. And the Holy Ghost hit her. She threw up her hands and went to talking in tongues. When that happened, that man right back there, stand up, Brother Larry. That man, his, his wife, who was just his girlfriend at that point, she led him down the aisle. Or his sister, one of them, led him down the aisle. And when he got down the aisle, the ministry laid hands on him. When the ministry laid hands on him, the Holy Ghost hit him, knocked him to the ground. When, he, when his head hit the floor, he went to talking in tongues. But when he got up, he could see, hallelujah, hallelujah. God had restored his sight while he was on the floor receiving the Holy Ghost. That built faith. We said, everybody else that wants the Holy Ghost, come on across the platform. We marched them across the platform, and everything in the house that didn't have the Holy Ghost that night prayed through and talked in tongues when the ministry laid hands on them. I'm talking about revival at midnight. But you hear me? There was a thorn, a thorn, a thorn. Somebody had a thorn that gave birth to revival. Who shot that cock of a I wish every one of you could drive along Interstate 10 now. And see, 15, 16 years from that time, another church, nine and a half acres on I-10, 1,200 foot of frontage, a beautiful church there that I don't take glory for. There were thorns that gave birth to that church. Who shot Thorns, 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 Brother Mike Williams. What you're encountering right now. You hear me? It's a thorn, but it's going to give you a counterbalance that will reach further than you ever dreamed of reaching in your ministry. Somebody!
Somebody believe what I'm a preaching right now. Somebody believe what I'm a preaching right now. We saw the property. I drove the streets of Lake Charles praying, God, I never will forget. I drove the interstate. About every area of our city is covered with another one of our Pentecostal churches. I wouldn't have infringed on another one of their territories for anything in the world. I drove the freeways out of perimeter. I said, God, I hate to spend this much money back here in the corner where your church and your truth, your full gospel cannot even be seen. Please open up something. If it's not your will to open it up, I'm not asking for a kingdom. I'm not asking for the advancement of Eastwood or the advancement of a Ewing name. Please, God, for your cause. I get tired of churches with less than the truth having all the exposure. I want one of God's churches that preaches this Acts 238 message. I want them to have four pounds. It was a nine and a half acre track, three blocks down the street from where our old church was. But it happened to be in the corner of the main east and west thoroughfare, I-10, and the north-south thoroughfare. 171, the main crossroads of southwest Louisiana. But that nine and a half acres was not for sale. It had been the same family for 70 years. And then the grandfather of the man whose heirs we brought it from owned it before that. I don't know how long he owned it. They just wouldn't sell it. It wasn't for sale. But when God's preacher got desperate for a call, Two of the heirs of one of the original heirs just all of a sudden wanted their money. They had to sell the property to satisfy those two heirs. I drove just a few nights after I prayed that prayer, and there was a for sale sign on that piece of property. I called about it. They said, yeah, it's for sale. The people lived in Alexandria. We want 300000 for it. I figured they'd have been asking 100000 an acre. You hear me? God knows how to open the doors at the right time. But between the time when we found the property and when we made the deal on it, the board forward. First of all, I lost my boys. Six months, I didn't know whether I'd ever sing again. One night, I was trying to recoup. I couldn't go into the higher tones, and you know singing's a part of my life. Ministry's my first love, but singing is a part of my ministry. And I was in my, I was in my bedroom, and I'd gone for about two or three months, and I was saying, God, I know I don't want to damage my voice anymore, but I've got to know if I've got anything left, if I'll ever get to sing again. So I started on the scale. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti. It's just a blockage that the higher I try to go, it just nose off. I couldn't, I couldn't force it to come through. My little old bunny was in the other room, and she didn't know what was going on. She burst through our bedroom door. Mama, mama, somebody's cow's out in the yard. Joan looked back at her and with tears in her eyes, she told Bonnie, she said, No, darling, that's not a cow. That was Daddy trying to sing. And when Bonnie understood what it was, she had to laugh because it was so funny, but tears were streaming down her eyes at the same time. That was the first thing. When I finally learned how to sing again, I had to learn how to sing again. 
So when I learned how, then the next thing was a blood clot in my leg. I was on my way to Delaware to take care of take an engagement and a blood clot in my leg. The next thing, when I finally got over the blood clot in my leg, I came to preach the youth camp here in our own district and thank God for the for the invitation that was extended to me. But it was during that youth camp that I was in such pain that I would roll in the floor during the night after I'd preach. When I went home, found out that there was a mass in my colon. When they went in, it was malignant. They took the thing out. While I was recuperating from that, my dad in the hospital for gallbladder surgery, we thought. Before he got out of there, his heart failed. I lost him in the hospital. Things kept going until finally, when Joan and I would go over the overpass and we'd see that, that piece of property. You didn't even want to look at it. Please hear what I'm saying. There'll be times. I never heard anybody any more honest than Jim Larson was the other night when he said in the battle of that church building program, even suicidal thoughts come through his mind. I'm telling you, if you don't have something to anchor yourself to, if you don't have a counterbalance and know something about why that balance is there, it'll drive you up a wall when you get in the dark times. You hear me? And there's so much more that I want to preach, but I don't have time and I don't want to fringe on anybody's time. But you hear me? The greatest lesson of what balance is all about. We know the glories of Pentecost. We know the powers of an upper room. But we paid very little visits to a hill called Calvary. But you remember, there was a counterbalance called Calvary that purchased the right of a glorious Pentecost. But you know what happened at Calvary? There were people at Calvary that were there because love drove them there. But there were others there because wanting to be a spectator drove them there. Through different eyes, two crowds saw two different things. One was driven away by the spectator crowd. And the Bible says they had to view it from a distance. While spectators walked out. Scripture says when they saw the sight and what was done there, it moved them. They, they, they couldn't look at it and just walk away. They had to give some kind of an expression. So they just moved their breast and returned home. But you hear me? Calvary purchased more than just for a spectator to smite his breast. Calvary purchased the right for devotion. Humbling oneself at the foot of that sacred brow and identifying with the price that was paid there. Your spiritual level will determine what you see. If you're carnal, you'll see fear. If you're carnal, you'll see, you'll see hypocrites. If you're carnal, you'll always see devils. And that don't mean that it don't exist. But if you ever get on a high plane and go to looking through different eyes, instead of fear, you're going to see in faith. Instead of hypocrites, you're going to see in saints. And instead of devils, you'll see 15 angels between you and every devil. Would you stand? Lift your hand to God.
next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22, 16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3, 5, Romans 6, 3 through 6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings unto the remission of sins, for salvation, to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow, become a servant of righteousness, keep self pure, be an example, have faith in God, follow Jesus, put first things first, resist temptation, be faithful, and be fruitful.